and one of our poets is in uh, County Galway in Ireland, and it's 2 a.m. there right now. Um, the books that each of these poets put out, and some put out CDs and albums too, uh, they can all be gotten either um, from your local bookstores, including Bookworks here in Albuquerque, uh, and of course uh, online and from the poets directly themselves. Um, poets we have tonight are, of course, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Paul Muldoon, um, Adrienne Rice, another poet from uh, the north of Ireland, and Attractifahi. I'm going to introduce Attractifahi right now. Attractifahi has a background in farming, in nursing, and social care. She works in private practice as an integrative and humanistic psychotherapist and survivor um, and supervisor and supervisor. Um, she lives in a rural county Galway in the beautiful west of Ireland with her children. Um, she won the 2019 Irish Times New Irish Writing Award. Her new book is this one. Dinner in the Fields, highly recommend it. About that book published last year, um, the um, critic uh, Maureen Nynulin, Nynulin, uh describes Attractor's work as true poetry of the soul, which gives us a sense of our connectedness to the universe, to nature, and to each other. Irish American Society, we are honored to have all three poets, and we're uh, very specially happy to hear Attractive Poetry, uh, Attractive Fahi, no, <laughs> Attractive Poetry Fahi, yes, <laughs> okay, Attractive. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you to the um, New Mexico Irish American Society um, for inviting me for you and from you and um, it's such a privilege to be here and I want to thank Ellen for all her work and emails um, Kathy, Claire, Levi and um, I hope I haven't missed anybody there in that. So um, it's a wonderful privilege to be reading with two very prestigious po poets. Um, I'm feeling quite nervous, a bit like imposter syndrome. <coughs> um, <coughs> and their poetry I love, so that makes it easier. Um, I also want to give a shout out to all my friends that have um, checked in from Ireland and my friends from Billy Collins Poetry Broadcast to Billy and Susanna and all the um, friends from the group are um, cool people, nice people, and my friends from Cultivating Voices and any family. I haven't seen their names coming up, but I haven't looked. So I'm going to read a few poems first from um, my book. Dinner in the Fields, published by Flying the Wall Poetry Press. And just to say a little bit about my book before I start, it's um, it's a chapbook and it's my first um, publishing. And it's based on, um, I suppose, landscape and place and where I grew up. I grew up in Northeast Galway and um, I managed to progress over to East Galway. <laughs> I haven't moved out of Galway. So I think that um, I found when I started to write poetry four years ago, I, well, I'd always written, but I decided to do a course to, to learn the craft. I found everything I was writing was relating to place and where I came from. And as a psychotherapist, I know how important the formative years are. And really that was reflecting in the poetry, the formative years, you know, and that sense of place. So I grew up, <clears throat> I always say to people, um, I was born in a graveyard. I grew up at the top of a hill and there were two graveyards, one each side and no houses for a mile on one side and down the hill. So there was one a 17th century graveyard. So I was surrounded by archeological sites and I think that had a huge influence and that's reflected here. So just to give you that insight. So I'll start with my first poem, which is called Etchings. And it's, um, I suppose that's from my childhood and you'll pick up, um, it's me playing in the graveyard as a child. Etchings. There will be no miracles in the graveyard amongst the dead. Little happens in the quiet presence of departed souls. Our 17th century graveyard cradled our house, became my home. 
tall slabs like brothers guarded tombs, tiny wildflowers, buttercups in old grass, a welcome colour to the dead. At least spirits listened. Tension cannot hear. It cannot bear even its own silence. Spirits heard without ever a word. Fumbled walls of stone reveal their bones, holding slabs with words and ancient tongue. The intricate letters, hidden names, once carved to grace, now corroded beneath its lichen. <clears throat> Slipping little fingers through each line, clearing moss, powdered lime, a child traced slowly into life, etchings. And the next poem I'll read again is, is um, from the um, graveyard. And um, I suppose that 17th century graveyard, my family would be buried there several generations. And I would have thought as a child, all my ancestors are buried there. And I thought they lived underground. I had wild fantasies in that graveyard. And, um, you know, we sit, there's lots of old tombs and it was a great place to, you know, I grew up in the 60s, so there was no television, no phone. So you had your tea set and you could go down to the tombs and have a table and a shop and everything. They were very handy. You could play hide and seek. So um, that's where I thought my ancestors are buried. And I realized later in life that I have probably more ancestors buried in America. I have eight grand aunts buried in, Aust um, in Boston in one graveyard. So it's, but anyway, this is called Our Sleeping Women and I'm speaking here to my grandmothers. Our Sleeping Women. I think of my grandmothers their faces etched in mine. Their strength sleeps in my bones. We meet in fields of crows. Their voices speak through wind. All graves slope down from our farm. As a child, I played house, tea sets on tombs, innocent, listening to spirits. Daughters left to work with duty, not to themselves, but to others who cared little for the objects they'd become. From the clay they cry the song of the crone, dreams of the life unlived. Hope moves in the soil beneath my feet, rises in my breath. They call, willing me on with their work. Don't listen to scavengers who have taken your use, their fear ripping your pleasure. Scream yourself into your body. Starve if you need until you're heard. Your face ours. Your womb creator, the only real home, yourself. <clears throat> and the next poem I'm going to read is called Dinner in the Fields, and it's the title for the book. And it's about, you know, when we worked in the fields because everybody, it was all hands on deck. So I loved when my mother brought the dinners out into the fields to us. Dinner in the Fields. I remember you arriving to the fields when we saved the hay bringing the sweet taste of dinners encased in Tupperware. Sitting sheltered under haycocks in the warm sun. We rested our young bodies from sweating our work, tasted the bright tang of cut grass, drinking sugared tea from my wadi bottles, our dinner in the fields. After, we waited again for you to come in the evening. Buttermilk our snack between your arrivals. Longing for tea, we quenched our dusty mouths. Finally, the sunset took us home before another long day. Bodies stretched in the light, making hay. And um, I'm going to read another poem. It's called, um, <clears throat> I didn't know my father's father. I didn't know my grandfather. And this was inspired by um, just, I was thinking of a plow that was just leaning on a wall all our lives is still there. And um, I knew Seamus Heaney had written a poem about um, ploughing. So I thought I, I, it might have been 20 years since I read it. So I thought, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to write my own and then see. I was, that was the second part of my kind of exercise, which was I wanted to capture the same feeling of bringing people into what ploughing was like and see what the similarities would be. So I found it a very interesting poem to write because I went to his poem then afterwards. And there are similarities, but there's differences. And of course, the syntax in his is exceptional. You know, mine is a very different story. <clears throat> and it's called, I didn't know my father's father. I didn't know my father's father, but I knew his plough. 
Its remains leaned into the side wall of our barn, years groaning in on itself. I imagine it's still there, a dull brown monument resting on grass. My granduncle used a horse plough. He sat on its high seat like a king disposed as he cultivated fields, later parked in an outhouse. My father's hand plough was kept in the shed. I watched him oil and grease it and preserved all year in preparation for spring. The plough's sharp sting of metallic glint in the sun the knife edged double blades, curled, shaped in feminine curves, like a proud, strong woman. Watched him steer, hands clasped on bars, making a fist on the handles. His teeth clenched as if biting stone, meticulous eye in exactitude looking ahead, he cut line after line into the earth, slicing soil row after row the taste of supple mud in his mouth, each slice falling smoothly left, creating a furrow. I could smell the clay in the air as he put strength, focused his will on breaking the clogs, lumps, bumps, us with our spades clearing stones. I watched him battling in wobbles, sweat streaming his face, the power of a man working his plough the wisdom of fathers before him. This was the way of our life, like worms growing new heads for each season. My father knew ground must be prepared. Every beginning is joined to the end. What gives duration, the ways, cycles, how to cultivate and reap. Over our heads, a hood of crows picking chopped worms relieved to see they reinvent and um, <clears throat> the next one I'm going to read is um, called Owning of the Birds and my favourite writer as a child like I said we had no television we had no phone and we had an awful lot of books we had Beatrix Potter but there was a one book there that was belonged to my father from um, the um, 1930s and it was um, Porrick Pierce book um, I have it here. Play stories and poems. I keep forgetting which way, that which order. And we had a parlor. Everybody had a parlor. If you were any, if you were any, if you had any kudos at all, you had a parlor, and you only used it really for special occasions, the stations and christening. But that's where the books were, and I lo I loved to go in, because there was seven children. I loved to go into the parlor and read and. Also, when I felt a need for connection, if I wasn't getting the connection outside in nature, which is where I got it, I go to this um, story, Owning of the Birds, and it's about a young boy. It's the most beautiful story I've ever read in my life. And I had the same reaction every time I read it for years. I would cry and cry and cry for Owning. I loved Owning. And for some reason this year, my mother was 30 years dead and um, Owning loved the swallows and he Eventually, he used to wait for them to come and eventually he went off with the swallows. So my mother was 30 years dead this year and I was thinking of owning. And I wrote this poem only in August, so it's not in the book. It's called Owning of the Birds. Every year they arrive, their long journey across sky and land. I think of my childhood when I hid in the parlor away from the others. How often I read the story, Owning of the Birds in grief when he left, his mother's grief, an outpouring every time. 30 years since they took you to, a late August morning over the skies, a warmer land and the sun. This morning, I open my door, slight breeze through trees, rustling leaves, a cuckoo in the distance, ready to leave too, its young, feeding from a robin's bill. I imagine you somewhere in the nearby woods, absorbed in silence, singing to yourself, adios amigos. And every year when the swallows leave, I see you and Onin wave goodbye. Um, so I, I have another small one. I'm going to finish on one that's about the two mother and baby home, but there's one. I also wrote it's not in the book and it it was inspired just and it's because it's I'm reading in America I thought I'd like to read this 
it was the Portland rights that um, struck me and um, the, the protests and the rights. Um, I read a story about a woman who walked out into the intersection. I don't know if anybody knows about it, but people were talking about it. And um, I had read other stories and um, kind of um, other myths and about women. This was kind of a, um, the grain goddesses in Egyptian mythology. She, that's what she did. They would um, walk kind of naked and flash and whatever. So people were disturbed by this woman, but yet she had a profound effect because I read the whole story where the police, everything stopped, the police, the army, and they looked at her. And the story seemed to pass after a day or two. Nobody seemed to take any notice. So I wrote this poem about it. And it's sort of tiny with the grain goddess. Then we have the Sheila and a gig. So Sheila and a gig in Ireland is the, the pagan goddess as well. And you may, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it. So I call this the vagina goddess. 1.45 a.m. nightly protests in Portland. Sheila in a gig walks out onto the intersection, paces the crosswalk in front of armed police, officers in white gear. They stare, eyes fixated on her poise. Headlights glare as she moves in ballerina poses, naked other than face mask and cap. Hecate lies down, kicks up her feet, refuses protection from others nearby, her body defying their thoughts. Yes, I'm vulnerable. That is my strength. She opens her legs, a flash to all who dare look. Vagina goddess of Elysian mysteries. Ba rises from the burial place of shame, takes the stone head of patriarchy. Come, come, her eyes say, to men who believe you just grab her by the pussy. Come. Her body invites, it's dream time again. Divine, feminine, collective power. She tilts her head to her shoulder. They move away. Grain goddess knows how to relieve tension. Babu knows there's life, even in tragedy. Thank you. And I'm going to finish on a poem um, that I wrote <clears throat> because I come from Tune. And um, um, everybody, I'm sure, will have heard about the tomb, mother and babies, or the mother and baby homes here, and all the scandal. And for anyone that doesn't know the tomb, mother and babies, there was 796 um, babies found in an unused septic tank. And I would have been born in the Bon Secures and tomb. The Bon Secures sisters ran the St. Mary's home for mother and babies. And all of that stopped in the year I was born. The Magdalene loan continued, but the mother and baby home and the, all of this um, sort of women being put in there, young girls and babies being adopted out without the mother's permission. So all that stopped the summer I was born. And later I went back and I trained as a nurse and I worked there, but we really didn't know, you know, we knew there was a Magdalene laundry, that's it. So I start this poem at the beginning as an epigram from um, Seamus Heaney um, from his book, Anid. <clears throat> the Tomb Mother and Baby Home. At once a sound of crying fills the air, the high wails and the weeping of infant souls, little ones denied their share of sweet life, torn from the breast on life's very doorstep. A dark day bore them off and sank them an untimely death. Seamus Heaney. We called it the grove where nature offered refuge. I look at the photograph once cherished. Such innocence. This nun tended me for 10 days when my mother was ill. Does her smile appear hard? Conceal doom. The vow of silence has left us mute all questions. Did she coerce, tyrannize, or was her love overwhelmed by the poverty and overcrowding, so many daughters dumped in fear? What I want to know is whether these hands that once held me have blood on them. I see a gimp of starch linen beneath coif, cornet and veil, that rigid bib. I think of the vows the blessings of the bond secures. 
After school, I nursed in that wing, where I and these babies were born. Girls, there's a shadow in this place, I'd say. We have to let the light in. Each time the walls enclosed us. The eerie feeling haunts. I imagine dark rooms, darker silence. <clears throat> Within this lover of history, Catherine Corliss uncovers rumoured babies. She persists, reveals tiny bones, skeletal bundles and scattered remains. Young children, babies in a septic tank. Looking back, I shared a nursery with these babies. Their shamed mothers segregated from the likes of me. What if, and if, my infant imaginary friends in babbling conversations, ghosting themselves into my life, were thrown into septic reservoirs and sewers. I look again at the picture. Neither trust nor love is possible. The arms that held children in God's name are soiled. Once more, I glance again, this time behind the nun's habit, to a dark door obscure shadows on the walls. The baby she holds seems to look away, gazing out to the world, her eyes facing the light. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for it. Thank you. Thank you. Tractor, thank you so much. Brilliant is not enough to say. And thank you. Move. And uh, everyone is muted, but I can hear the roar of their applause right now. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Dr. Fahi, everyone, and her wonderful, wonderful book is uh, right here is Dinner in the, Dinner in the Fields. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs>